John Joe McFadden, welcome to How the Light Gets In. Thank you. So you're one of the pioneers of this rising field called quantum biology. Many people would have heard of molecular biology, but not necessarily of quantum biology. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, quantum biology is um, a fusion between biology and quantum physics. And um, it's come from the realization that at its most fundamental level, if you look down into the center of uh, cells and the center of the organelles and the center of molecules, you come down to particles. And actually, the action of life is really in motion of fundamental particles, electrons and protons, within biomolecules. And really, life is all about directing that motion to make more life, to keep us alive. And if you ask any physicist if you're, uh, how to account for the motion of fundamental particles like uh, protons and electrons, they'll point you at quantum mechanics. Now, I was brought up as a biochemist. That was my, that was my training. And we knew nothing about uh, quantum mechanics. Um, but gradually, as I became more and more um, knowledgeable about the uh, biology at its most fundamental level, it occurred to me that quantum mechanics must be involved. When DNA is replicated, particles move from one place to another, and they're delivered along their paths by enzymes. So enzymes are molecular machines that move particles. So they're quantum machines. And, um, and really this whole field now is, uh, of quantum biology has grown out of this realization and the discovery, experimentally, that quantum mechanical effects are going on in living cells. So for example, I'm looking at a tree outside here and that some of of what happens in photosynthesis involves the motion of particles in a quantum mechanical way in which they travel along multiple paths simultaneously and they can only do this in quantum mechanics and this is what quantum biology is about. And is, is quantum biology therefore going to be as revolutionary for the life sciences as quantum mechanics was for physics? Is it going to I, I totally it alter will. our... I mean, I, I, as I said, I um, was trained as a biochemist. Biochemistry came as a fusion between biology and chemistry. I think quantum biology is a fusion between biology and physics, and I think that's the next big fusion in science that we're going to see a lot coming out of this interface between biology and physics, including quantum biology, but also many uh, scanning devices, etc., uh, that are used in medicine already use physics and quantum physics. So it is a, a very um, a fruitful um, interface. One of, the, one of the phenomena that uh, quantum biology has, is studying is quantum proton tunneling in, in DNA mutations. Can you tell yeah. us what that is? And, uh, yeah, this is, is uh, in fact, what initially interested me in um, quantum biology. Um, DNA consists of a double helix, we all know, and the genetic code is actually the substrate of the genetic code are protons along the double helix. Protons, single particles along the double helix. Where they are is written the color of your eyes, your propensity for various diseases, and is coded at the level of protons. And that's a quantum code. And it was speculated many years ago that um, uh, mutations could be caused by protons quantum mechanically tunneling from the right to the wrong place. Now, that seems rather strange, but um, protons normally would not be able to go through a particular barrier. Quantum mechanics, the weirdness of quantum mechanics, allows them to go through a barrier that if they were a classical particle, they wouldn't be able to penetrate. And that can cause mutations if the proton ends up in the wrong position in the double helix, then when it's replicated, the DNA strand that's made will be a mistake, will have a mistake in it. We call those mistakes mutations. So I became interested in whether this was a cause of mutation 20 years ago. I went and gave a talk about it in the physics department at the University of Surrey, and they were very skeptical, but Jim Al-Khalili was in the audience, and we got together afterwards. He was interested in the idea. We got together afterwards, eventually wrote a paper about it. I went on to write a book, Quantum Evolution, and and 20 years later, the field is beginning to blossom. And now we have a quantum biology doctoral training center at the University of Surrey with about 20 PhD students currently studying quantum biology. People will have heard of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, Schrodinger's cat. 
Uh, how, do that, how does that all apply to the very small level of life? Do those principles shed light in well, how well, life functions at the very small? Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, as I mentioned, the photosynthesis seems to depend on, on um, an aspect of quantum mechanics. And this is a Schrodinger's cat aspect of quantum mechanics. Schrodinger's cat famously can be alive and dead at the same time. As a, as a um, photon of light is transported from one place to another in a leaf, it can go through a single path, if it's a classical particle, but a quantum mechanical particle can be in multiple places at once, just as Schrodinger's cat can be dead and alive at once in the, in the story. And this being able to travel by multiple paths at once may allow photosynthesis to be more efficient at capturing energy. And there is a mystery at the heart of photosynthesis. It, in optimal conditions, is 100% efficient. No technology we have comes anywhere close to how efficient that first step, it's not all of photosynthesis, but it, that first step is, under optimal conditions, 100%. Every photon of light is captured. Nothing in technology approaches that, and quantum mechanics may account for it. Early on, many years ago, Roger Penrose wrote this book, The New Physics and the Emperor's uh, Mind, I, I, if I remember the mm. title correctly. And part of the idea was to try and apply quantum mechanics to you know, the science of the mind, the science of consciousness. You have interests in consciousness as well. Does, does quantum biology promise a better understanding of human consciousness? It may do, but there's no evidence whatsoever at the moment which would um, uh, convince me of that. Uh, as you say, I do have uh, an interest in consciousness. I have published a number of papers in the area of consciousness. Um, none of them depend on quantum mechanics. When I've been speaking about quantum biology recently, uh, the quantum biology is going on at, at the level of, of a few particles. You know, a proton can be here or there, within a DNA molecule, say. For quantum mechanics to account for consciousness, Protons or electrons or other particles would have to travel, would have to have this property across your entire brain. And no physicist I know would um, uh, think that that's at all possible. So I don't think the quantum mechanics, or at least we haven't got any evidence for quantum mechanics being involved in consciousness at the moment. My own idea is that it's the brain's electromagnetic field, that the brain's electromagnetic field is consciousness. Your mind is an electromagnetic field. So it's a physical thing. It's not the matter of the brain. It's the energy generated by neuron firing, an electromagnetic field. The same kind of information, the same kind of physicality that gets a signal from a radio mast to your mobile phone, for example. That's an electromagnetic field. That is in your brain. And what I'm claiming is that consciousness is that in your brain. It's that electromagnetic field sitting within your brain structure. So would that be a, a kind of emergent property, as it were, from the other processes going on yeah, in the brain? Yeah, exactly. And if you like, the rest of the brain can be considered as a kind of computer that sends information down wires, called neurons. Um, but on top of that, there's the electromagnetic field generated by all of that neuron firing. And um, this is where I believe uh, consciousness is. But it's not present in computers because we don't use that information in computers. When computers are built, we try very hard to prevent what is called electrical interference, which is these electromagnetic fields interfering, starting to change the information that is in processing that's going on. Our brain has been coping with that problem for uh, millions of years, and we think, I think that the solution it found is to actually use that information, and we call that our conscious mind. And it's actually this information that's pooled into a, if you like, a pool of electromagnetism, where all of the information is held in one single place, this pool of electromagnetism, and it's now available to all of the neurons in the brain, and that is where consciousness resides. Let's shift from science to the philosophy of science, as it were. You have a new book uh, that's called Life is Simple, How Occam's Razor Set Science Free and Unlocked the Universe. Can you remind us briefly what uh, Occam's Razor principle is? Yes, it's named after a chap called William of Occam, who was a Franciscan friar, friar born around 1285. Uh, uh, so he lived in the uh, 13th, 14th century. And he came up with the principle, well, he didn't come up with it. Many other people before him, even the ancient Greeks, had a preference for simplicity. 
but it was a fairly weak preference. William of Ockham, um, he, he studied um, theology at Oxford. At that time, theology was called the Queen of Sciences. And that was because there was no difference between science and theology. Um, scholars studied questions such as, you know, what angels are made of, what the gates of heaven are made of. And this was considered to be part of science. Uh, Aquinas, a generation or so earlier, had supposedly proved God, the existence of God, in five different ways, mostly taken from Aristotle, like everything that moves is moved by another, so there must be a first mover. Um, Aristotle also said that everything has a purpose, so there must be a purpose to everything, and he called both God. William of Ockham came along and said, no, this is all nonsense. Um, the, uh, the first mover argument, the final cause argument, he decimated all of those, saying, for example, that objects don't need causes, they're just there. A fire is hot, it doesn't need a cause to be hot, it's just hot. So he used his razor to do that. He eliminated causes that were not necessary, and his razor, Ockham's razor, often uh, described in the, in the way uh, entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. So if you don't need a final cause to explain things in the world, get rid of it. And at that time also, um, people were, uh, the philosophers were what are called philosophical realists. And they believed that every object, like a circle, has a universal, a kind of platonic form of circle hiding behind it. And... Um, and so a, uh, a father has a universal of fatherness, a king has a universal of royalty, and the whole world was suffused with these universals. Everything had these hidden universals. William Wacom said, no, none of them exist. That was important because you know, in the medieval world, kings were kings because they held this universal of kingship which they could pass on to their children. So the whole structure of the medieval world depended on this notion of universals that were these invisible entities. Um, William Bobockham said they don't exist. And that stripped away a lot of the metaphysical baggage of the medieval world. And then he went on to say that there are two ways of working out the world. One is science. And we do it with reason. We get rid of all the baggage, so we use Ockham's razor to get rid of all the stuff you don't need. That's science. On the other hand, he was a Franciscan friar, there is religion and theology, and there you can believe in angels, you can believe in gods and whatever you like, but don't mix it up with science. All the scientists in the subsequent centuries took that same approach. They delivered simpler solutions in their science and they kept religion and theology out of it. And this was really the turning point of science. So in my book, I claim it is the fundamental uh, premise of science is simplicity. Simplicity is a, a kind of human value, almost you might say an aesthetic value, right? So how do we explain the fact that it's such a good guide to how the world outside is? There's probably many explanations. One of them, it, it can be explained in um, Bayesian inference, which is down to Thomas Bayes, another cleric, of course. But uh, yeah, he came up with this uh, form of statistics. Now, I'll explain it with two dice. They're invisible dice at the moment. <laughs> I've got the real ones in my bank, but we won't bother with those. One dice is a normal six-sided dice. The other is a 60-sided dice. And then, unseen to you, I will throw one of these dice, okay? And the number that comes, comes up, I will say, is a five. Now, which dice have I thrown? People will realize, of course, it's got to be the six-sided dice because there's only six different numbers it can throw. The 60-sided dice, there are 60 different numbers it could throw. So it's so a smaller probability. A smaller probability of throwing the five. So this comes out in Bayesian reasoning, the likelihood function. The likelihood function is the probability of the data given the model. So the model six-sided dice, probability of one in six of throwing a five. The model 60-sided dice, probability of one in 60 of throwing a five. And Bayesian reasoning says choose the simplest because it's the most likely. So, for example, that was used then in the same kind of reasoning was used to argue for, by Copernicus to argue for heliocentricity. The model he had, the heliocentric model, was no better at making predictions in the heavens than Ptolemy's model. But he argued that it was simpler. So that argument that it has fewer parts to turn, to change, so it has a higher probability of 
of generating the data if it fits it. Of course, if it doesn't fit, then you've got to have a more complex model. But if your simple model fits, you could, should go with that. All of science does that. John Joe McFadden, thank you very much. Thank you. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas 